Again, as scientists, we kind of prefer to go to the places that are having problems and solve that problem. <laughs> yeah. We rarely publish papers, this forest is beautiful, which is amazing. <laughs> it's not going to get published. It's not going to get published, right? So our job is to sort of try and fix things, right? Yeah, so yeah. it doesn't, I'm yeah. going to go where there's a problem. And this is causing this and this is happening and we can predict this. This is bad. Other than my vote, I'm powerless to to make change. Yes. Yeah. Not only like us scientists has to work together, but also like the governmental agencies. Mm -hmm. They should like work together, not like, okay, I deal with the land, so I only manage the problem of the land until this line. And yes, after this 100%. line, it's like another area agency's business. Like what you said, those species, they don't care about this line. <laughs> what they care is like, okay, I use this different habitat for different like functions. Yeah. Hi there, yeah. I'm Dr. Aziz Muller. You're listening to the Ripple Effect podcast, where we discuss some of the most current issues in and around Taiwan and why they should matter to you. After all, whatever we choose to do or not do can create ripples that have major consequences. This series is brought to you by Taiwan Plus, in association with our original docuseries, Our Ocean. Now, let's not waste any more time and dive right in. Today is climate change, um, a really big, difficult topic to, to talk about in such a short amount of time. Uh, but I have two fantastic guests and colleagues of mine, uh, which I'm very happy about. Uh, so maybe you can introduce yourself first. Sure. Uh, I'm Trevor. Um, I work in Kenting and Nanren Shan, sort of southern Taiwan, mm -hmm. uh, studying forest ecosystems and currently specifically parasitic plants and their interaction in the, the, the systems. I know zero about that, so that'd be good. <laughs> we, can, we can talk about it. <laughs> and uh, my actual colleague uh, from, from the same lab as me, I'm lucky to have her. Yeah, uh, and I'm Vicky, and also a marine like ecologist, and working in the same place as ASIS, like I work in National Taiwan University. And then my research is mainly about like uh, coral reef ecosystem, yeah. So first question, which is the best? Forest or marine? <laughs> marine, of course. Yeah, more interesting. Forests are the best. <laughs> um, we're here to talk about climate change, and I think it's something when we all kind of get together, we we kind of discuss um, maybe in a bit more detail than we will today. Um, but on the surface of it, what actually is climate change, and why is it such a hot topic around the world? It's probably the most important topic, and mm -hmm. as we're here today, it's important because it it connects. All the ecosystems. Yep. It can bring coral and forest and, and all the people that study different ecosystems together. Um, and what it is, is a, a tough, <laughs> a tough nut to crack. It's That's a, why I came to you first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we need to know that the climate does always change. It's, yeah. if we go back hundreds of millions of years, of course, it's always changing, but it's the abruptness of it mm -hmm. changing now, the intensity of what's changing. And ecosystems have evolved and been able to adapt to slow and progressive changes. Um, but what we've been doing is literally fueling uh, an excess energy in the, in the atmosphere. Yep. And this is causing temperatures, but not just temperatures, it's causing the whole systems to weather change. Patterns, weather patterns, like, yeah. rainfall, temp uh, temperatures plus rainfall, um, the, the length of dry seasons and rainy seasons, monsoons, typhoons, all those things are changing. And so that's that sort of captures what climate change is. Yeah. Today. More, more specifically for marine ecosystem, let's start with marine. Like, what are the kind of consequences of climate change uh, for maybe people out there that don't really know what climate change causes? Uh, in marine, we because there is water, yeah. so like it will have a trend like for example, like some chemical compound in water. In, so it would be like ocean acidification, the reducing the pH of the seawater. I think it's very like something specifically for marine, yeah, compared with forest. Yeah. What about um, forest though? Because like yeah, we mentioned the, before, like mm. <laughs> we have no idea. Well, forest is <laughs> uh, terrible for us. Uh, well, we can expand this to trees. Oh, sorry, that plum plants in general. You know, plant ecosystems, whether they're savannas or high mountains, or mm. it, it's it's not just about. I mean, the chemical connection, I guess we could say, is the CO two. Yeah. And a lot of people mm. say like, well, CO two is just Plants, I learned this in, in, you know, grade nine, plants eat CO2. And plant food. Plant food, they yeah. should be happy. But it's, you know, going back to what I said, it's the whole, you know, there's there's drivers and disturbances which kind of regulate how ecosystems function. And climate change affects all of those. Yeah. So it's it's not just the chemical, you know, it's, it's the amount of water, it's the nutrient. A lot of water can leach nutrients. So there's not enough nutrients to balance the CO2 and, and all those um, things. So... 
I think for forests, it's it's just the weirdening is happening too fast. Yes. And I think that's the same for kind of marine ecosystems as well. Like it's how fast the change is occurring. Yeah. And in particular for me and Vicky studying corals, like, and they can't keep up with this change. They have no time to, I want to put this word out there, adapt uh, to it. They don't even have a time to kind of adjust to, to this at all. We know that they can, uh, but they just don't have that, that, that time at all. So if you liked uh, our content from today, please like and subscribe um, on YouTube, but also on Taiwan Plus website, and we'll post all of our links to social media below. Make sure you like this video and subscribe. Um, so for marine and forest, it's, it's kind of detrimental. There's, but in terms of us on on living on this on this island in Taiwan, like how does it affect us? Again, I'm going to come from a very terrestrial perspective, but yeah. I think where I live and work is very marine based. We live in yeah. it's a very um, a lot of coral reefs in the south, and so what we need to remember or be aware of is that we're directly connected to it. Yeah. It's it's. You know, sometimes we think of the forests are out there and the oceans over there, and I'm here. And in cities, it's tough, tough to mm. remember that. that it's kind of like an ecosystem within itself. Yeah, we've we've built in a city, and but we're still connected and reliant on those. Yeah. So when they die, when they crash, when they are in trouble, it it really affects us. Yeah. Resources, um, you know, ecosystem services, the the umbrella term, you know, yeah. but um, it, it's there's direct consequences. Yeah. Especially for more rural areas that do interact more directly. Um, but even something as normal as we go to the supermarket, it's filled with food. Yeah. That food comes from the land or, or the water. Yeah. You know, so if those ecosystems are in trouble, then our dinner plate becomes. Definitely yeah. it affects everything in the ocean. We'll, we'll be talking about this on another podcast about fishing as well. The fishing industry, like Taiwan being like the second biggest fishing industry in the world. Um, and if anything goes wrong in the ocean to impede that, stop that, it's then people on land that, that are going to suffer because of it. Um, as well. Most specifically for marine, maybe you can speak about the coral bleaching we had in 2020. Like, why was this such a big issue? At the time, I remember it was all over the media mm. in, in Taiwan. And I mean, for us, it's still in our mind every day as when we go to work. But why was this such a kind of terrible event in, in Taiwan? Uh, for coral bleaching, it's like uh, you know, coral is a kind is an animal that uh, holds like diff, uh, small algae inside their like member, and then they rely on this small algae for like gaining the energy and new nutrient. So once they lost this important like algae partner, they would like be like very weak, and it's what happened. And when it's happened, we call it coral bleaching. Yeah, so. They, it means that like they are white and they lost their uh, color. Mm. So uh, it makes coral become like weaker. So if they couldn't like resist to eat, they will eventually die. Mm. And like coral is a very important like uh, organisms in marine because they kind of, uh, they are like, uh, like foundation, of, foundation of the ocean. They build a house yeah. in the ocean and to allow like many mm. other like relevant species to come and to live. Yeah. So if they are bleaching, they die, then there are many species they will lose their place to live. And yes. there are also many place, uh, species they just rely on coral for like food. So these species will also lose their food. So it has a very uh, uh, sequential like impact in the marine ecosystem. And like what you say, it will eventually influence like uh, what we eat yeah. and uh, what we can see underwater, like a tourism value. Yeah. yeah. It, it also more in, in reference to Kanding, we have a barrier reef there yeah. as well. Mm. You can see above and uh, not many people know that in time we have a barrier reef, not like the great barrier reef for sure, but it plays a very functionally a functional similar role. role. Yeah. It, uh, you know, it protects our coastline uh, yeah. for sure. And, that, and if the coral's dying there and it becomes bleached, it gets weaker and maybe disappears. All it takes is a typhoon for it to, 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 for it to be carried away. We lose that kind of protection, um, in, especially in the south of, of Taiwan when we have typhoons coming. So they play such an important role in, in our lives that um, yeah. a lot of people don't really know about it. Yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, um, maybe a bit of a tangent, but I do a lot of workshops with schools and mm -hmm. community groups down south. And when I talk to a lot of the younger generation and I talk about that barrier reef and I talk about the corals and the fish, they don't it's not part of their life. Even being yeah. in a rural community, mm, yeah. it's not part of their life. They're not, it's not directly, you know, relatable to them. Yeah. Of course, some, of course, people yeah, yeah, yeah. fish and that, but like there's this underlying theme of disconnect. Yes. Yeah. And so even people living on the reef, literally, uh, <laughs> or adjacent to the reef, 
it's it's not in their mind and when the bleaching happens it's like oh okay you know yeah, yeah. That, that that part of it's kind of a little bit yeah, of a disconnect but I, I guess in a lot of places it's, it's kind of like that you have this disconnect from something that you you don't know so much about but i feel i mean vicky do you feel like it's got better over time over your life people know much more about the ocean people are interacting with it better in taiwan uh, i think we still have a lot have a lot of space to improve for yeah. building this connection because for example for me i've been working in like uh, MMBA in like aquarium in Pindong and then to like introduce like a marine ecosystem to the small kids like elementary school junior high school yeah. and uh, I think this kind of uh, and in my opinion like yeah I really observe the there's a huge gap like between these kids and the ocean for example um when I like because I introduced like different like fish species in the mm. aquarium, and when they see this real fish like uh, <laughs> in front of them, they were like, "Wow, this is <laughs> blah blah fish." I never know. Yeah. yeah. For example, like milk fish is something like very common on our like di uh, dinner table, but uh, they never see like how they swim. They yeah. saw like the fish <laughs> was like this, and then swim in the water, but no, in reality, they have a fins and mm -hmm. everything, yeah. Oh, that's cool. So yeah, I think that's a very like important experience for me to know like this gap. So um, we have to have someone like to like uh, build this gap, probably like the teachers in maybe elementary school, junior high school, like to introduce the concept of marine or forest ecosystem to those yeah. children. I think like yeah. a hands-on approach is really good, like to go visit an aquarium, like an yeah. MBA or, or to go into the forest. It's not, it's not far away. No, yeah. at, at all. We're never far away from it. Um, and I think we, we in in the docu series we actually covered some of this, like schools in Chaliocho, for example. To graduate, you have to like kayak around the mm -hmm. island, and it really yeah. brings kids like so much closer to the ocean. It's a place where uh, we should be mindful and we should be cautious, of course, because around Taiwan, as we all know, it's quite dangerous. But we can enjoy it safely. And but you gain caution and awareness by experiencing. Definitely, it's yeah, the yeah. separation sure, that makes sure. it more dangerous yeah. and mm -hmm. not being aware. And I think that experience creates the connection for sure yeah, and it's it's essential yeah coming back to climate change kind of a big question on this is um my parents always ask me like oh there's so much on climate change other news and um, how do we solve it what is the what is, how can we get from like a to b the fastest the most efficient way um as scientists what would you say is the solution i would say i'll take off my scientist hat and put on a politician's hat <laughs> we need to first agree that it's the problem is caused by this mm -hmm. it's the the there needs to be some consensus a consensus yeah, yeah. and then we can have science-based solutions to that yeah. but we need to agree that this is the problem first and there's there's still governments around the world that and i'm from canada our economy is based on polluting the air yeah and so um there needs to be some awareness of that being the core problem okay but for me, uh, going back to scientist, I think we document the problems. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'll go to the forest and I'll I'll show this is what's happening, this is what's happening, this is what's happening. We need to find someone <laughs> who's going to listen. Yes, yeah. Because as a scientist, my skill set is this: it's to read the it's forest. It's not a politician. No, uh, you know, really, my politician yeah, hat's yeah. gone. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's and your job is to read the ocean and tell us what's happening. Yeah, we provide evidence. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is causing this, and this is happening, and we can predict this. This is bad. Yeah. Um, but I am, um, other than my vote, I'm powerless to to make change. Yes. Yeah. So sure. I think I think yeah. So I, I think another thing that is also important is that. To have a consensus, uh, we need to like kind of like build this awareness like among the people. So I really believe uh, the education is the very powerful tool to do yeah. it. Like what we just mentioned, like those kids, and it, uh, we need to like build this uh, knowledge gap between us and those kids. And on the other hand, we also need to like try to like com um, communicate with the old people, trying to let them know it's something like very evidence and something is happening. And starting from like the experience we have, 
because I think to just speak about data, because we are scientists, we yeah. mostly speak about We love that. data. We love data, <laughs> yeah, for sure. We are like data nerds. It's not nerd. the best thing to communicate. It's not yeah, a communication for sure, format for sure. with all these facts, statistics, but it doesn't sound like anything unless you kind of experience it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for, for sure. That's kind of takes on to our next part, like generational divides in Taiwan mm. have a really big kind of impact on our policy. So I think one, what, one of kind of my solutions to it is to really speak to older generations, like younger generation to older generation, really communicate and go, this is the issue that we're going to face. Like, can, can you help us? Yeah. You know, can you get on board with this, yeah. uh, with us? I think that's kind of, uh, an important factor, not only in Taiwan, um, but all around the world. So globally, to, for sure. Yeah, yeah, globally. I mean, that's the thing. It is a global problem. Yeah. It's a global for, for sure. situation and, and small places like Taiwan, and small places, you know, smaller island countries that are going to be affected the most or are being affected, yeah, do have smaller voices, yes, globally. Um, yeah. And so it's a big, <laughs> it's a big task, yeah. But I think the the like you said, the communication to different and every generation is going to have different problems or perspectives mm. on yeah. it. You know, the kids, this is the future you're coming into, yes, and trying to address that. The el- older generation, you know, what legacy do you want to bring? Sort of you know, communicating differently. I, I really think it does kind of affect a lot of um, national kind of issues in Taiwan that we don't think are directly related to climate change as well. You know, we know we, we, we live in a, a big period of environmental degradation. Why aren't people having children? Because they don't want to bring their child into this world where we have so many issues. I'm not saying that's the only problem for sure. It's, it's definitely the only reason, but it's definitely part of that. Like everything's kind of doom and gloom uh, with it. And uh, I would say for the marine environment, it's not all doom and gloom, uh, for sure. We go to places where are absolutely amazing. I'm sure you do in the, in the forest as well. Um, but it's that risk of losing those places, which is really kind of spurs me on that we want to keep them relatively pristine. Sure. Are, yeah. And I think this links also back to what we were talking about previously about the education and experience. And, you know, again, as scientists, we kind of prefer to go to the places that are having problems and solve that problem. Mm. Yeah. We yeah. rarely publish papers. This forest is beautiful. This is amazing. It's not going to get published. It's not going to get published, right? So, and also we know it's, it's okay. We don't, our job is to sort of try and fix things, right? Yeah, so yeah. it doesn't, I'm yeah. going to go where there's problems. Yeah. Um, and so experiencing, having people experience that beauty and the overwhelming, you know, diversity of, you know, functional, beautiful, intact reefs, you know, can make them, you know, like, oh my God, this is what could be. Yeah. And they're like, oh yeah, but look at this reef over here. If if we keep doing this, it's going to be like this mm. here as well, you know, trying to bridge that gap, but have them, again, find a connection to the ecosystem. For, for yeah. sure. For the sure. Beauty for sure. And the, and the so grandeur. I think in this case, like the rural the NGOs and the summer camp can play is very important because they are like very professional for this. Like for, for my, for example, for myself, I learned a lot, like how to communicate with kids, mm-hmm. many yeah, and and to like make them how how can I make them realize like how beauty the marine ecosystem is by using different tool, different way to express. Yeah, 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 and to show mm. what we actually have on this relatively small island is very mm. incredible. And the like, diversity and how quickly you can go from different ecosystems. I mean, just thinking huge. of the yeah. forest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a small hike can mm-hmm. take you through very very different ecosystems, and yeah. it's. And, and those ecosystems have totally different species. So you're seeing different, you know, different assemblages of different plants that are, for me, stunning. Yeah. And also when I take groups out, because I do a lot of public outreach with, with um, kids and adults and, and park staff and everything. And when I show them, there's a little bit of awe. Like, I didn't realize. I didn't know. I didn't know. Yeah. This was here. And, and it's like kind of like, I know now. And it's, yeah. it's great. Like, yeah. and, and, you know, I, I mean, I was ex- uh, really... Uh, kind of influenced by my geography teacher in school at one class on volcanoes. I don't study volcanoes, but (laughs) but it was one class that got me interested in the natural environment. And you could be that person for for, for that kid at such a young age. Yeah. Yeah. Let's think about on a kind of local, national, regional scale in terms of government, like locally, what can we do as individuals to address climate change? Think of us living in Taipei, you live in the South, yeah. a little bit different, but what can we do as individuals to address this? That's a tough one. Yeah, because, a big question. Uh, <laughs> if millions of individuals do things, yeah. then you get change. If yes. 10 individuals do things, it's worthless. It's, yeah. it's um, fashionable. Yeah. And, you know, even the idea of like 
recycling. It's been sold to us as if you recycle, you're going to save the environment. Like, well, no, that's, that's, that's the very least. Yeah. You know, we should be doing this anyway. We shouldn't yeah. be having so yeah. much plastic produced that needs recycling. That's the problem, you know, yes. going one step back before we try to solve the problem. Um, but with climate change, it's, and like you said, the energy requirement for Taiwan, a small country, yeah, um, it's, it's hard to fill that without the, the base load. So yeah, like to fill up the, the kind of base load of it, like we need energy. No yeah. one's saying we can't live in a world mm. without energy for, for sure. Uh, but where we get that energy from, we have the solutions already. Yeah. I know um, the, the UK has worked with Taiwan on this in terms of um, wind energy, um, and we have an unbelievable amount available to, to us here. And I think it is more about that collaboration. We need to not only think about our own backyard, but everywhere. Yeah. Because if Taiwan's doing 100% in terms of effort, and the region isn't, then it's going to more than cancel um, us, us out for sure. Yeah. So on a regional level, what would you like to see in terms of working with other countries, for example, around us? I would say Taiwan is very special in this situation because we are a country, but somehow not a country. <laughs> so <laughs> it's cause it's a really big issue because it's cause uh, us uh, it's cause us cannot like have a normal relationship with other countries mm -hmm. to build so to build up this kind of uh, for example some like contract between countries or agreement or agreement like yeah, yeah, yeah exactly it's super hard for us yeah, yeah. I think the one thing which we do. It is quite easy and we are recognized in Taiwan is science. Science yes. really mm. doesn't have that much of an issue bypassing it. When we go to conferences, mm. um, we're representing, you know, whatever anyone thinks about this island, um, this, this nation that although you say it's in a unique political position, it's also in a unique geographical position as well. Yeah. We have a mm. huge current going through um, on, the, on the East Coast, and this really impacts both forest and, and marine yeah. ecosystems. Something which I think we don't get bogged down by is the science. Like, you know, we, we, we're pretty free to, 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 do, to, yeah. to get the message out there. So that's yeah. kind of maybe a route bypassing the political side of it. Mm. Um, yeah. But also in that, the scientific collaborations yeah, yeah. of, you know, I often we'll have, to, uh, not tourists, uh, scientists from other countries come and for the first time experience Taiwan, I, I help them collect this or do projects. And they're, to a person, they're all like, I didn't realize yeah. this was Taiwan. You know, the, so Taiwan- The Galapagos of Asia. Yeah, That's what it, it is. It's, yeah, it's so amazing and so biodiverse and so geographically creative. It's, it's, There's so much stuff to do mm. here. Like yeah. that's what's kind of kept me and it's, for a long time. It's overwhelming. I mean, that's why I stayed. That's yeah, yeah, why yeah. it's what captivated me to stay was just how nuts it was with how biodiverse, how, you know, the mountains and the topography and things change so quickly. And it's such an interesting place. Yeah. And the science and the collaborations can be a, a powerful tool to talk outside of Taiwan Definitely. and can make those connections. And I think it has been largely. Yeah. Um, so thinking of the future in terms of climate change, um, we know the causes, uh, we know some of the consequences now, how it affects us directly. How do you think life is going to change over the next 50 years in Taiwan? I have a really good friend of mine who's 80 now, and he told me in the summers of the 1950s, 60s, they would turn the AC on once or twice a summer. Now in the summer, it's Every day, every it's you know, every time, seven, yeah, yeah, it needs to be on. Um, so things have changed so fast. How do you think it's going to change over the next fifty years? I, I think for me, living in the south, it's much more agricultural. Yeah, of course, there are crops that we grow now that are reliant on drier periods and heat, um, or they're they're tolerant of this. And so I think the crops we grow there might be. Um, it's not my specialty, but they might be uh, more resilient, more able to to sustain themselves long term. Um, but the, the natural ecosystems aren't so robust, maybe, yeah. or resilient in, in that. Um, so I think there's going to be a, a degradation of the natural ecosystems. We, this is going back to what we first talked about. But um, that has knock-on effects on yeah. human well-being. And I think that will be a creeping slowly and then a, a, a sort of, not, I shouldn't say catastrophic, but it'll at some point in the near future reach a point where it's like, oh, this... This is oh that that thing was yeah. happening when I was you know um, so from my terrestrial perspective that's something I there's always a lag 
And, and it, um, I, I was listening yeah. to a podcast this morning about the financial crash in 2008 and how we didn't feel the effects of that until around 10 years later. And as it really got me thinking about like ecosystem degradation. Yeah. So like we, we looked at the bleaching in 2020 of uh, the coral reefs. I looked in like Lanyu and Ludau. And yeah, it was bad at the time, but we need to look at the effects of what it's actually, what's happening the, the years afterwards. And that's why it's really important to keep monitoring these environments because yeah. what we'll find is that it really had a kind of legacy effect yeah. and you can still see that. Uh, yeah. And that's one of the problems I'll say with science too, is that our, our work is usually in short chunks. Yeah. It's really hard to get mm. grant money to funding, funding to get, <laughs> uh, you know, a third year. And I will say in forest ecology, there's a lot of long-term forest plots that have, 20, 30 years of, of data oh, that's cool. and, and they can, mm -hmm. and Kenting's one of them. Um, there's a bunch in Taiwan that can tell stories. And when you oh, put yeah. them all together, they tell a different story than what my, you know, master's thesis told or what someone's PhD yeah, told. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's, it's uh, not our fault, but it's mm -hmm. a limitation of what science can do, to, mm -hmm. but finding those legs and finding that whole story is, is essential Yeah, because yeah. then you can also make proper policy decisions to fix it or to deal with it. For sure. That's part yeah. of like the bridge in the gap as well. Like is, uh, our, is our science actually getting out there to the right people that they are, you know, really looking at it? No, maybe not reading everything because, you know, reading yeah. papers is difficult, but, um, are they actually making decisions based on the science like we did during COVID, like we yeah. do during times of crisis? Yeah, like we sure. make decisions based on the science. Is that actually happening over this long period of time? I think the idea, you used the word crisis, and I think that's the important part. COVID was a crisis. Yeah. It was a real thing that was really dangerous, really worrisome. We really worked to solve it. And Taiwan, like you said, did an amazing job. Mm. The climate crisis is so muddled with misinformation and disinformation and, yeah. and political, and it's a long term, it, you know, by 2075, there'll be whatever degrees. It, it doesn't hit people the same way. Yeah. So I think the communication is, is going back to what you're saying, education and that, you know, we can, all of us could publish papers every week in the top journals mm. Mm. and not solve the problems of the yes. world. We can spend time going to schools once a month and, help solve problems for sure yeah for sure, for yeah. sure. speaking about like long-term data like you the things you just mentioned there is a very like in marine ecosystem we uh, the long-term data like we have is mostly concentrated in like fishery data mm -hmm. and then it's very obvious if you look at the fishery data we catch like less and less fish and the fish size we catch are like become smaller and it's uh, I'm not saying it's all because of climate change, but it's definitely that like, has some influence on the fisher, fishing yard. Yeah, so I think uh, it has a uh, big relevance to Taiwanese because most Taiwanese like to eat seafood. <laughs> so I think it's very important for us to find like some like sustainable solution to make this industrial like to last like forever, mm -hmm. I hope. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think that's where uh, we can all agree like long term monitoring data comes in. And maybe because, you know, Taiwan's very unique history in this region as well, we're, we're lacking some of that. You know, we we'll go to places like Europe, we have hundreds of years of data mm -hmm. usually. Um, that doesn't mean we're any better at solutions, I have to say. Um, but we, this is kind of the evidence to put to people to say, look how badly things have changed. Yeah. How can we get back to, to this environment that wasn't pristine to start with, but how can we get back there that will help us in the long run? It's a really difficult thing to do, especially in an election, like you said, because things are over such a short amount of time. Yeah. Um, but the long-term monitoring data for me personally has been amazing like even over 10 years it's something which you you cannot get a story from it in any other way um unless you have this long-term monitoring yeah. period yeah for sure because nature doesn't work in our political cycles it doesn't mm. care about it doesn't work in, in a phd cycle yeah, yeah. or a career cycle yes. even you know yes. it, it it nature works on its own time mm. and if we actually want to understand it we need to try and work within that that limitation and then from that we can teach and, and tell, but that also doesn't mean we have to wait 70 years to say mm -hmm. like, I think the reefs are in trouble. Yeah. Like, you know, it, yeah, yeah. there comes a point where we know, <laughs> but, but there's to untangle the story. It does take more than two year for sure. study. Yeah. For, for sure. Yeah. I think as well, targets that, you know, government set, um, they, they need to be ambitious. I agree, but they need to be achievable. 
Yep. Like as well, achievable and effective yeah. rather than unachievable and therefore not effective. Right. So if we say we're going to uh, net zero by 2050, I want to know where did that number come from? Where did that year come from? Why not 2040? Yeah. You know, why are we not go- Yeah, you know, why, yeah, yeah. why 2050? Yeah. And usually it's because it sounds good. Uh, usually because it sounds good. And that government is not going to be in power at the time. Right. That particular government. So they don't really have so to. So if we don't attain it. this, it's not our fault. Right. It's your it fault. to the law. Right. It needs to be the law. Um, in, in whatever capacity that any government has to do this. And I think other countries have done that. I think the UK have done that. I think although they're- Bhutan is a great example of, on a different scale, but mm-hmm. we're not to get into the details, but nature is written into the laws. Yeah. It's, it's you know, it's not just a political or whatever the-, the It can't really be used as a political- it's, Yeah, there's no, it's just, and it's accepted and it's understood as mm-hmm. an important part. And I think- I guess going back to your question earlier, maybe not as as strong because I think it might be hard to implement that (laughs) Mm -hmm. retroactively, but to have that ethos as important and and work towards solving all these problems. Because, you know, for forests, it's not just climate change. It's logging, which has largely Mm -hmm. been legal logging has been curtailed, um, but still persists that's kind of important as well like we we speak about it a lot in the lab about pressures so um you know we have pressures of the fishing industry we have pressures of natural disturbances huge in taiwan something we not had a chance to speak about uh we have um cranothorn starfish invasive species disease and then on top of all of this we have climate change, climate change pushing down on everything and making everything that much worse, including our daily lives as yeah. well. You know, when in the summer we're walking down the street and you're going from A to B, it should be a five minute walk, but it's like a five minute shower because yeah. you're, <laughs> you're sweating. sweating yeah. You know, how long can we live in an environment like that, especially if it's going to get worse? These are kind of the questions which I feel in 2050 we'll be asking and we'll be kind of like, well, we already... We're talking about we it. Knew about it. Ago, we knew about it. We knew about this already. We just didn't want to face the, the reality of it. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I think finding a way to put it into law is definitely a, yeah. a way forward for sure. Yeah. Coming back to our, our respective ecosystems in terms of forests and, and the marine environment, you know, for, for viewers maybe who haven't been so much in the forest, who haven't been to a coral reef, why does it matter? Who cares? I think as scientists, we have read enough and learned enough that there's a, a visceral understanding of why it does matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can kind of go into the science of it, why it does matter in terms of functionality, but like to the, to the, you know, the, the average person, what, what does it matter if these mm-hmm. ecosystems disappear? How's it going to make a difference to, to my life? Well, I think you can speak of the ocean better than I can, mm-hmm. but I think the, the fish and the food, not only yeah. the, the food on the table, but the employment of catching the fish. Mm. And like, it's, it's especially in the South again, and also in the North, yeah. it's a huge part of the economy. It's a huge part of the culture and the coral reefs are a huge part of both of those. Yes. Right. So, um, I think for the ocean, people might have a stronger connection immediately than with the forests. Yeah. If I speak about, you know, forest assemblages and species turnover and eyes glaze, like, what is that? What that mean? <laughs> I mean, I can, it's, it's it's clear to say, you know, the biodiversity of your forest is related to health, which is related to the ecosystem function, Yes. which, you know, the, the availability of clean water, the um, limitation of, of landslides, yes. things like that um, are important and cause massive impacts. That's actually something that does connect us because it was landslides that caused um, when uh, Typhoon came in 2009. Uh, typhoon Morikot, the Taiwan's deadliest typhoon, it was landslides that caused the most environmental damage right. in the ocean. In the, oh, ocean. in the ocean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So all this land was swept into the ocean and just completely smashed against the reef and cleared the area. So one night there was a beautiful coral reef there, maybe 40, 50% coverage. The next was close to zero. Close to zero. Mm-hmm. So that's how that's so how we are so connected yeah. Um, yeah. there. And that typhoon actually wasn't that big. So it literally became well. the rainforest of the ocean. <laughs> yeah, it literally became. The, most of the forest was in the ocean, uh, for, for yeah. sure, yeah. Wow. But it shows how these two ecosystems, and there are far more in, in, in Taiwan, you've identified a lot um, in your papers, but um, the, how they are very much connected. There's no point kind of looking at one without looking at the other. And so we probably should... It, collaborate it comes back to our, our own fault and being yeah, so yeah, focused yeah. on what we're doing and not yeah. the ecosystem scale interactions between you know ocean coast 
mountains. It's, yeah, we should definitely, yeah. we definitely, we started to do it. You know, we look at things like forest ecology and demography and things like that, but I feel we're like lagging behind too. And we're playing catch up to and, and going, Oh my God, there's so much, so many other yeah. things that forest ecology, what enjoys a much longer history than marine sure. ecology. And so we're kind of catching up and playing yeah. this part now, but I think we definitely need to work more to, to solve these I things. do a lot of work, not my expertise area at all, um, with land crabs and a lot of public outreach and education in Southern Taiwan. It's a very, it's the highest diversity of land crabs in the world in Kenting. Okay. Well, um, mm, yeah. but it's a perfect system because land crabs live in the forest. They go to the ocean to spawn and they go back to the forest. So the spawning habitat is vital for their survival. Yeah. The ocean habitat, I mean, the forest habitat is vital for their survival. So when I'm teaching about that and sharing with people, it's, that's all I'm thinking about is how yeah, connected. Yeah. And that's my goal is, yes, I'm, the land crabs are cool in this, but it's the ecosystems and yeah. their importance and connection. And, and this is um, a representation of how nature works. Yes. This isn't a one-off. This is how nature actually works. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So I think there are opportunities to, to teach it, but also to study it in that. To really bridge that, the gap between yeah. these yeah. two things. And one thing I want to speak about is that not only like us scientists has to work like for example, forest ecologists and marine ecologists work, work together, but also like the governmental agencies, mm -hmm. they should like also like uh, work together. Not like, uh, okay, I deal with the land, so I only manage the problem of the land until this line. And yes, after this 100%. line, it's like another agency's business. I think like we should also like uh, try to make I don't know how, but I feel like this is something like I feel a lot in Taiwan when yeah. I was doing my research. Yeah, and it's uh, caused a lot of problem because like what you say, like those species that don't care about this line. <laughs> what they care is like, okay, I use this different habitat for different like functions. Yeah. 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 That, that, was, that was actually one thing Taiwan got extremely, uh, did extremely well in COVID. They integrated the whole system together. How is this going to affect education? How is this going to affect the, right. the tourism? How is this going to, and it's one thing that we're realizing in the UK, which was one of the worst response, um, that they didn't do that. They kept those lines up and, oh, that's the, they, I can't step on their shoes and things like this. So there has to be an integrated approach mm -hmm. across integrated. government like we did in other crises yeah. um, where everybody is working towards the same goal together and not and willing about, to give a little bit yeah willing, willing to, give to a bit. take share and, give and compromise yeah, yeah for sure yeah. we have it in the philippines you know when you go to places like boracay you have to sign a waiver and things like that to say you'll protect the environment you can't do certain things you are restricted because it's for the sake of the environment and yeah. we could easily implement that um across across taiwan you use the word sure. restriction which is a political hot potato in some places because <laughs> you know you say that to some people you especially take in, in right, north america yeah. yeah no i freedom trumps everything yeah and um Freedom is more important than everything. Mm. And so I feel like Taiwan does still have this, my freedom is maybe secondary mm. to the greater good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah. you know, I, I have the freedom to drive my car everywhere, but I understand that I probably shouldn't yeah. in these situations. Um, so I think it's, it's, there's a culture here that still maintains this idea of, I'm maybe not a number one. Maybe a healthier relationship with healthier relationship with, yeah, yeah. with society yeah. and, and how it impacts the world. Exactly. So I think we saw that in the docuseries as, as well. Like as we went around Taiwan, uh, we saw so many people willing to go out of their way, usually off their own uh, effort and money to make the environment better in whatever, whatever way they can. So I remember there was a, a lady who created a contraption to clean up the harbors um, using like a kind of video game thing. And um it was that local kind of step that, as, as we spoke about, maybe has a very small impact in terms of climate change, but we should be doing these things anyway. We should want to yeah. look after our environment yeah. in any way we can. Uh, for sure. Not just for votes, not just for money, yeah. but for the purpose of making something better. Exactly, mm. exactly. When I speak to people, especially about the pollution in local cities and things like that, it's our it's our children breathing that air. Yeah. And they're going to breathe that air for the rest of their lives. Like, why wouldn't we want to clean it up yeah. for, for them for sure? Um, and we, I didn't really start thinking about it until I went to university and I was like, wow, it's been bad. It's been bad. And we have got better. However... <laughs> some things have gotten worse. Some things have... And those yeah. things that have gotten worse... Uh, 
are really scary in a lot of ways, yeah. uh, for sure. And yeah. um, to finish up, I kind of want to speak something that as scientists we don't usually speak about as well, like our, our feelings. And um, so when you go to these places where you see coral bleaching, where you see degradation in forests, um, I remember my first time going to see the bleaching in 2020. It was from uh, when we were landing in Taidong, actually. Um, and we circled around the island and there was just like a halo around Green Island of why we didn't really need to go into the water to, to see no. uh, the bleaching. It was obvious. And it kind of got, it was a feeling of, uh, yeah, it was a, a sad, of course, curiosity as a, as a scientist, but it was also apprehension like, oh, wow, is this going to become a regular thing? If mm -hmm. it does, we'll have a job. Yeah. Like, will I actually have a job in the future? Because these ecosystems have so much to offer, but they're being destroyed. Being destroyed. Sure. Edit, so how, how does it make you feel seeing these in, in nature? It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. But going back to hope, I know that there is a solution. I know that there is potential. But I also know what it was or what it could be. And and I know it's it's a shell of what it, you know, yeah. many places. Um, many places in Taiwan are still very pristine, very mm -hmm. uh, a primary force in that. But... Yeah, when you see the destruction, you see these impacts happening, it's it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. But for me, I try and use that as fuel to do more science, but also outreach and try yeah. and, you know, take this energy. Maybe it's inside me, it's bad, but let's bundle it up and, and use it for good yeah. and always work on fixing it. Yeah, And I guess for, for Vicky, like more, because obviously you're Taiwanese, like how does it, these are Taiwanese coral reefs, these are Taiwanese forests, like how does it make you feel... Um, and it's not just Taiwan doing this. It's all over the world where we're exploiting our environment. But how does it make you feel that these are, our, you know, such amazing ecosystems we have here, but we are degrading them? Yeah. Um, actually, like my first feeling after I see like the mass coral bleaching event in like 2020, I actually feel like it's a little bit beautiful, but really beautiful because yeah. you don't you really see this kind of white color appearing in ecosystem. And then... Uh, I really feel like sad uh, after one year after when I see like in some region, like the corals really die and covered by different kind of species. Yeah. So it's where I see, oh, okay, something should happen. Yeah. And then on top of this uh, effect of climate change, like when we go to the sea often, like uh, not only me, but I, I, I guess like for like people who go to the seaside very often, they can... Uh, often see like there are so many trashes, so many like pollutions in the sea. So it's really like make, uh, yeah, make me heartbreaking as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, for me, I try to like work with people to have the same face as me. Like they also want to change this. And then we try to like deliver our like voice to build up our voice and then to deliver it to like uh, people who don't, really aware of it. Yeah. I think it's there, but people just need to go and see that and they yeah. can realize like how a serious problem is. Yeah. So I think that's, and that's why I like say yes to uh, this podcast mm -hmm. to come here because in the beginning I was a little bit shy to be on the video. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, but I think it's important. Had to take a little convincing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's my feeling about it. Yeah. yeah. It's, I think as well as scientists, we're not really trained for outreach and things like that. It's kind of, we kind of get involved with it, but um, there are people, especially in Taiwan, more than willing, like say, to give up their time. We saw that in the docuseries to do this. And and it's also bridging that gap between us and, and, and them as well and kind of forming this collective voice, um, not in opposition to the government at all. Uh, I believe that a lot of people in governments around the world are on the, on the same on the same sure. line as us, but it's actually making sure they have effective policy that can actually make a difference in yeah. this. Because if we want to live in a democracy, that's the way that we we, we want to go and kind of change yeah. things uh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And I think people are, like you said, people do care and also a lot of people are looking for opportunities to do yeah. something more than just walking to work or recycling they want. And you know, going back to the land crabs, a really brief anecdote. Um, I, so people will drive their cars and we, we block the traffic so the crabs can cross and then people get out and help the mm. crabs, like catch them, and <laughs> take them across the road, literally. Yeah, yeah. And so um, one couple stopped and just said, like, we're waiting to cross. And they asked me what's going on. And I just briefly explained it. And they're like, you mean we can help? Like, mm -hmm. it was like, oh, we can. I'm like, yeah, I have some nets. Let's go catch crabs. And 
and so they got out. Anyways, we, I walked with them for half an hour and we did some work. The next year they came back, so they bought cool. cameras and gear <laughs> and they were there to not make documentaries, but just to film and, and show it. And they were doing tours at schools in Taipei. They said, kids in Taipei, I grew up, I didn't know about this. I'm Taiwanese. I didn't know about this. So they invested their time. And in the next three years, I saw them coming down. Amazing. And they were filming and, and creating content. And not like, I want to be a YouTube star, just to go yeah. to share with schools in Taipei, um, which, where they're from. Because that was something they could do. Yeah. You know? And they were like, I, I feel good. Their time, their money, their resources, just to, to make something better. And if kind of everyone went down that same path. Right, right. But I guess maybe, you know, the solution is finding places where people can have those opportunities. Yeah. You know, what can sure. people do? Not everyone can afford, you know, thousands of dollars of, yeah. of, of equipment maybe, but there's, everyone can do something. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like in, uh, we spoke about this uh, last week um, during COVID. Uh, so many people's relationship with coral reefs like increased because diving and free diving became such a popular hobby and sport, um, that the awareness of it was huge. And it was at the time of the coral bleaching as well. So there was so much documentation of it, mm. but fatigue is a kind of the big thing about it. Like people kind of got tired of it and it kind of went away. And we, we, we see this a lot through a lot of different topics and, and events happening around the world. Uh, but how do we keep that momentum up? How do we keep that pressure on, on government and government bodies, uh, to, to actually make, uh, effective policy is difficult mm -hmm. because I'm sure you feel it as well. You know, we have doom and gloom, doom and gloom, doom and gloom. And we also get like bogged down by it and tired by it, I'm sure. But what keeps you kind of going? What keeps you motivated? For me, because I keep going to the ocean, I guess same for you, you keep going to the yeah. forest. So you see the change every year and you can see like uh, there is something really happened like the ecosystem keep degrading or like it just become worse and worse yeah and so you have to like report the situation mm -hmm. for sure and then use like what we can do we provide data or we do some experiment like to prove yeah, the degradation is really happening so i need to keep fighting to make people understand why it's happening underwater so despite people get fetish we still need to be there like to say something yeah. because maybe one day they come back and they know the things we provide is like useful. Yeah. Yeah. Have just to have a record. A record yeah. of documentation. I think that's, of it. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. And I think it's kind of special as a scientist, you can leave your footprint and your your name will be on that paper with that data mm -hmm. for people to use and um, mm. for, for hopefully the, the rest of time. Yeah. And hopefully it can be used. If the right people yeah. make the right decisions based on it. For sure. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so you can catch our episodes of The Ripple Effect um, on Taiwan Plus. You can also catch up on the docuseries on the Taiwan Plus website as well as YouTube. Uh, we'll put the links in the box below. Uh, remember to subscribe. If you like this episode, you can also like it too.